we are doing this a conference to launch a report we did uh, at CSI is called Innovation-Led Economic Growth, Transforming Tomorrow's Developing Economies Through Technology and Innovation. And um, it's been a, a lot of fun, and it's been a privilege um, to work with my friends at the Research Triangle Institute, RTI. Um, I've known Aaron Williams for a long time. He's a friend and a colleague. I've known Paul Weisenfeld for a long time. Uh, these are people I really admire in development and like. Uh, and then he said, he also said, you know, we've got these really great teams. I was like, okay. And the team's fabulous. These are wonderful people. And they're smart uh, and interesting, and they have a fabulous network. Uh, and it's been a privilege to work with them over the last year. It's been a privilege to have a partnership with RTI. Uh, and when I first they said, well, we want to do this thing, this innovation stuff, science, technology, innovation, innovation-led economic growth. I'm like, okay, it's, we're going to do this in Africa. I'm like, really? I mean, how much is there? I mean, that's like a term. There's a lot of term for use of innovation. But I, I don't know about you all, but I, I think there's like, that term is often overused in a lot of different contexts, the term innovation. And I was like, I don't know. But you know what, what they said, no, no, trust us. We work with some of the, you know, we work with governments all over the world. And um, they, um, this is, and so I said, okay. Uh, and that we, there was also a whole series of things that were revelations to me in this exercise. One was something like 60 or 70 developing countries have science and technology innovation strategies. And when you, you read these, you say, okay, okay, that's interesting. What you find is these represent the hopes and aspirations of developing countries, what their hopes and dreams of their future is. And what I've said to policymakers, what I've said to potential presidential candidates is, my view is that we, we need to think about development as enabling the hopes and aspirations of developing countries and people. Because if we don't help meet the hopes and dreams and the aspirations of people, they today can take their business somewhere else. Now, they didn't used to 10 or 15 years ago. They, you know, there's a large country over across the Pacific that's available. So they, we ain't the only game in town anymore. So I think that's also part of this conversation is that this is about the hopes and dreams and aspirations of countries and people. But the other thing I came away from this exercise was this conversation, and we're gonna get into this in the panel. I, I would say if you said, okay, what are the four or five pillars of the future of development? This is one of the four or five pillars of the future of development. So I, I got into it, I was kind of, I was interested because I wanted to spend, you know, work with Aaron Williams and I wanted to work with Paul but this blew my mind. This has been truly a really interesting exercise, and I want to encourage you all to read the report. And I'm really glad you're all here for the panel discussion because we've got some really fabulous panelists. I'm really glad, though, beforehand, I want to talk to Wayne Holden, who's the president and CEO of RTI International. Wayne, thank you again for your partnership. So, okay, so can you just explain um, what is RTI? Because I think just so everyone knows what it is, and you know what, I've got some leading questions for you that, that I think are gonna relate to this conversation, but just first start with, what is RTI and what do you guys do? So RTI is a uh, large research organization, a 501c3 based in Research Triangle Park. We were the first organization founded there in 1958. We have a very broad portfolio. We do everything from basic lab science to implementation in the developing world and everything in between. Uh, we are interested in turning knowledge into practice and delivering the promise of science for global good. So we're really interested in very large problems in the world, uh, trying to attack those with creative and innovative solutions and putting them in place in order to facilitate change. Okay, but Wayne, the, what someone, one of your colleagues said to me is you guys are a university without classrooms. Is that a fair statement? Uh, I would say that our origins were we were a university without classrooms. I would say that now we are a uh, much more dynamic, action-oriented, implementation-focused organization that has its roots in research. We are a research institute. Everything we do is either based in the research that we do or the best possible evidence for affecting change. You're not a small organization. No, we have 5,200 staff worldwide, and our portfolio this year will be a little less than a billion dollars. Okay, so you're the billion-dollar organization many folks have not, don't know enough about. How about that? As opposed to not heard of but not know enough about. Yeah. Fair enough? Okay. Okay, so I think uh, what I have found is, um, so 
I think one of the reasons that we, you came to us is, so let's just rewind the tape in North Carolina 70 years ago. Was North Carolina's economy is a, it's a very different, and there's some North Carolina natives here, I know. Uh, but so who, you know, so 70, 80 years ago, it was a different kind of an economy. Yeah. And you, I think you guys had something to do with it being a different place today. Yeah, 70, 80 years ago, second lowest per capita income for a state in the United States, highly dependent on tobacco, agriculture, some on furniture. Post-World War II U.S. money was pouring into universities like Duke, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, NC State. The high-level graduates were all leaving North Carolina. There were no jobs for high-level, technically trained people. And that's why Research Triangle Park was established. We were the first organization to encourage people to stay. Okay, but uh, it was a lot of tobacco, right? There was a lot of tobacco. And um, there wasn't a lot, there wasn't, there was, the, the, who, who came up with this idea of Research Triangle Park and what did you guys do? Okay. So this idea was a combination of government leaders, the governor at that particular point in time in particular, of business leaders who knew that the future had to be different, and of leaders in academia coming together in a triangle uh, to try to figure out what to do and what we needed to do to try to establish a different direction that could hopefully over the next couple decades move the economy in a different direction. We now have a much, a much broader innovation ecosystem well beyond Research Triangle Park. But we started organizations, we also recruited organizations in, Many people don't know that at one point, a decade or two ago, we had the largest IBM office in the world in Research Triangle Park. I know Most idea. number of people sitting there. Uh, the biopharmaceutical sector established themselves there. GlaxoSmithKline uh, really started as Glaxo decades ago in Research Triangle Park. So we grew organizations, we recruited organizations, we pulled them into relationships with government, with industry that was already there and we use the academic relationships to funnel in talent. So, okay, so now you, so let's fast forward. So, I mean, people who've been to North Carolina know it's, a, it's just not, it's a very different place than 70 or 80 years ago. So you have lots of clients in the developing world who say, can I, um, can I just get that off the shelf, please? I'd like, can I have a, can I have a modern North Carolina, please? I'd like that. So can you just, can you just kind of, can I just order, like ordering a pizza or, you know, can I have a, can I have a transformed eco innovation led economy? So if someone said to you, I want to do that, would you say, what do you say to that? Do you say, is that, well, give me, give me five years and we can do that? Is that, is that, that happen in five years? No, it doesn't happen in five years. And I think what you say is your context is different than our context. Your culture is different than our culture. Your assets are different than the assets we had at that point in time. You have to figure out what is, what is it that's happening in your context at this point in time and figure out what your path is for driving forward, how you need to do that. I would say that our experience would suggest, and a lot of people around the world, their experience would suggest that government has to be a player, industry has to be a player, and the research and development sector, which is primarily in universities, needs to be a player. But other than that, the path you choose to take, whether it's a, a park you set up or whether it's a set of policy initiatives to encourage a particular industrial sector to develop, you have to determine what's going to work right for you. And, and no, no one of these things, as you have said, can be copied and pasted and replicated and pulled off the shelf and just grown someplace else. Now, you, you've got clients all over the world, though, that have said, I want to learn from the Research Triangle experience because I know that my economy can't just be commodity driven. If I want to move up the chain of development, I can't, if I want to go from lower income to lower middle income and lower middle income to middle income and middle income to a wealthy country, I can't just have commodities to do that or it's very hard to do that, extremely hard to do that just with kind of having that one component. So is it, is it, it's, what does it require in terms of, in addition to having some sort of a, whether it's, it's, it's you need different sectors to work together, but is there a, is there one you need, is it, do you need certain, is it require political leadership? What is it, what are some of the components that you need to, to, to given the different context, what's it, what's it require? So I want to reflect back on something that happened over the last six weeks to me. So uh, we have a project in the Philippines called the STRIDE Project. It stands for Science, Technology, Research, Innovation, and Development. It's in its fifth year. It's USAID funded. About six weeks ago, a study tour came to the United States. It included individuals from government, from the universities, from the private sector, 
people in that project. They visited Silicon Valley. They also visited Research Triangle Park. They yep. looked at the models that are available in the U.S. Uh, they're thinking about those things. I did a visit to the Philippines just two weeks ago, spent some time with them, uh, working with uh, the project, working with groups of people there. Uh, they're taking some of the ideas that they have and they're trying to figure out how do they fit into that context? How do we do things that are actually important for our economy where our economy currently sits rather than striving to do things that may not actually happen because we don't have the platforms, we don't have the sectors, we don't have the issues that uh, uh, may coincide with what people are trying to do in Silicon Valley. So I think that's a great example of people learning from what's available, but then also taking it and recontextualizing it. And they've also done a really good job of taking talent in that country that were people who were educated in the U.S. One who I met who's a, educated as a microbiologist at Georgetown, who then worked for GlaxoSmithKline for five years and then went back to the Philippines because his heart and his interest is really in innovation ecosystems and developing innovation ecosystems. Another who was uh, educated in Yale as a biochemist and then also went to Harvard Law School, went back to the Philippines to do that. So I think it's, yes, you have to have those three components, but you also have to have people who are talented, who are skilled and really have their heart and passion caught up in trying to make the types of improvements that are necessary to develop a whole new way of having an innovation ecosystem because you can't copy and paste the others. Let me just, I wanna just have, talk to you about one other topic because I think one of the things I took away from this exercise was the issue of human capital. Could you talk a little bit about how that, that plays into this, this conversation? Yeah, well, I think that's really critical, and I think it's a combination of things. I think I gave you some examples of people coming to the U.S. getting educated. Yeah. But I also think it's an issue of developing human capital within the educational system that you have currently within your country. Some of that starts with basic skills, you know, and... and you got to be literate and numerate to even literate, get out of the door. Numerate, STEM education yep. that occurs prior to getting to higher levels of, uh, of education. Uh, that all has to happen because if you think about it, a lot of the workforce that's working in larger systems that are driving innovations are not necessarily people who are trained at the doctoral level who've gotten tertiary levels of education. They're people who maybe at the secondary level may have gotten a year or two in a specialized training program that really focuses on taking a particular technique or a strategy and applying it in a science and research capacity in an organization. So I really think the issue of figuring out what you can do to develop that capital, being able to put the resources in place to make that happen, being able to make sure that you've got some of the facilities that you need for people to learn those strategies, those techniques, uh, is really critical. I also had an opportunity to visit some labs recently, uh, also in the Philippines, where there was money made available to, to put lab equipment in place that allows people to be able to get experience with relatively cutting edge lab equipment that's gonna drive innovation forward in the biopharma sector. You have to have that available locally to be able to get people to the point where they're able to take that and then apply that within a commercialization context as they spin out whatever innovation that they've developed. Okay, so let me just, let me just push just a little bit further on this issue of human capital and education. I would assume then that just learning by rote is not enough. Would you agree with that? No, I would agree with that completely. And I think that uh, being able to uh, have the soft skills that you need to be able to navigate and work with people, I think the issues of innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, creativity, risk-taking, doing the kinds of things that you need to do to be able to drive forward uh, with a particular idea and make it successful is critical and really important. I also think one of the things, we had a pre-game lunch, and one of the things that came up was the issue of empathy, to be able to connect with people. I think that working, the, the innovation and transforming, a, transforming an economy requires working in groups and understanding where they're coming from. But I also think one of the things that I took away, and I suspect you'd agree with me, Wayne, is it, it helps if it's not just, uh, it, it, uh, if, if, it's, if it's not an overly inclusive group of people, you're going to have kind of a less robust outcome. Is that, a, is that a way to describe it? Yeah. No, I think that diversity and inclusion is really an important part of coming up with creative solutions that can be applied to particular contexts. And I think when we cluster ourselves away and come up with a solution, that oftentimes what happens, and this is clear in the United States too, we come up with an interesting 
basic R&D solution, we pay no attention to the context or the marketplace. And oftentimes those things have no applicability. So what we need to do is we need to include everybody who's involved in a particular issue and a particular problem from a wide set of varying perspectives to be able to come up with a best solution. Yeah, it seems to me that um, the, uh, that the future requires being able to be inclusive, empathetic, and requires not just science and technology, which is certainly oftentimes talked about in these contexts, but having the ability to work in across groups and bring a large, a large community of people together. Yeah. Look, uh, Wayne, it's been a privilege to work with you guys. And I'm really glad we've got this great panel. Uh, thank you for um, entrusting us with this work. And I'm thrilled uh, to be partnering with RTI on this and rolling this out. So uh, I'm going to ask the panelists to come up. And we're going to do a little set change here. And I think we've got some, some great panelists. So thanks, thanks sure. for everything. Thanks for the opportunity. We look forward to continuing to work with you. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Come on up. Taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us. Um, so, to my left, we have Terry Lomax. She's the Executive Vice President of Discovery, Science, and Technology for RTI. Terry had a past life at, at North Carolina State, mm -hmm. right? And then my friend Vaughn Tarikian, who is a senior board member of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, but up until about 20 minutes ago, was the Science and Technology Advisor to the Secretary of State and is a really interesting person. I'm so glad he's here <laughs> and he's a friend of mine. And then we had Sonal Shah, who's the Executive Director and Professor of Practice at the Beak Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown University, has had stints in government and also at Google, if I recall correctly. And then um, Phil Oswald, who's an Associate Professor at the Shah School of Policy and Government at, at George Mason and has been the author of a number of books who I have bought many of them retail and actually read. So thank you, yeah. Phil, <laughs> for, for being here. So let me start with you, Terry, is the, the issue of cross-disciplinary backgrounds of the work that you all do, bringing together economists and engineers, social science, technical experts. What, you know, just a little bit building on the conversation we were having with Wayne about education and training that you just can't have just kind of one dimension. Could you talk a little bit about why, how you, how you bring all these different experts together? I saw it in the work. We had various disciplines come together in our conversations and our work over the last year. So talk a little bit about the thinking behind that, if you would, please. Well, the challenges of today are very complex challenges. You can't come at them just from the engineering aspect. We saw that in the past when there was cook stove competitions. And you can have an American engineer sit and design a whiz-bang cook stove that nobody in a village in Africa will use for cultural reasons if the men can't repair it or something like that. And so you really need to look at these aspects from the social sciences, from policy, and then you can apply the engineering and the technology and bring that to bear on, on problems as well. So what about this? Wayne talked about in the RTI experience the relation between government, universities, and the private sector around research and development. Um, when I've, you know, my friend Sarah Lawrence, who's here, would tell you that it's very difficult to get these three different groups to kind of be aligned and work together. So how do you how do you make that happen, and how how what what's needed for that to succeed? Um, I really think you need to have them understand how much they need each other. And that's not always easy, but especially I think between industry and academia, that's a lot easier because industry realizes they need that workforce. They need the talent, they need the research and things that come out of the university. 
universities, of course, need industry to um, provide them with the real world aspects of what they're doing. What are the problems that they're going after? What do they need to solve? But also to provide those jobs for their students and to provide, hopefully, support for the universities and for research. It's government that's more the wild card, especially when you have changes, because you can have build that relationship with one government and then you get a change and then it switches and you have to rebuild that again. And so um, there it's just a constant, to me, re-education to them of the value that everyone can bring together. So in, it's certainly the case in, say, in the U.S. context that the, this is a very well-trodden path and you've got clusters all over. People think of Silicon Valley or the Research Triangle. There's also emerging clusters that you all are working with in other, in other parts of the world. Could you just talk a little bit about how this plays out in, in developing countries? Sure. A great example of that would be in Indonesia, where we have a USAID-funded project um, to work with them on higher education. And their, um, one of their minister of higher education was really pounding on their universities to um, come up with commercialization and with, of their innovations. Well, when we did a deep dive to look at what their capabilities were, what we realized is there were no government programs to fund their researchers to do the research in the first place. So we helped develop them to see that and develop the policies that now there's the first $10 million competitive research grant, basically the equivalent of, of our National Science Foundation, $10 million for the whole country of of Indonesia, but it's at least a baby step. It started from zero, it's now 10 million. It's zero to 10 million, but you had to educate those ministers first about why you need that to stimulate the research so that you can have the innovations, and then you can think about commercializing. You can't just commercialize out of thin air. Now, I just like to say this isn't your grandparents' developing world. Mm -hmm. It's richer, freer, and more capable, and this is an example of that, that this is, you know, it's about how do we enable stuff that is ready to happen. I mean, Indonesia is a, you know, becoming an, a wealthy country or is on its way, and, and, but they also, they don't want to just be a commodity-based economy. They, right. want, they want this. Yeah. So that's great. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. That's excellent. That's really great. Okay, Vaughn, thank you for being here. I think you had one of the coolest jobs in government, being the chief science advisor to the Secretary of State. Um, uh, we were talking at lunch at, that I, I would re I'd prefer, if I have to choose between China or Japan, Europe or the United States or any other country, I'd still prefer to be the United States in, as part of this conversation in terms of what we can <laughs> offer the world and what the world wants from the United States. I mean, I think there are lots of countries that may not like our former government. They may not like who sits at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, depending on the day. They may not like our policies on this or that. But they almost, to a, to a country, all want to, they want a research triangle park, they want a Silicon Valley, or they want access to all the scientists at universities and the kind of places that Terry used to work at when she was at NC State. Um, how, you know, so talk about how this conversation came, in, it came across your inbox uh, in your last job. Well, first of all, thank, thank you, Dan, and, and thank you for inviting me upstairs. Yeah. I think this is my first time actually getting up those hey, stairs. If you play your cards I, I, right, if you I, play your cards right, I, we I, do. I, 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 We've got I even better it, floors up. I, I know what the basements look like in many buildings. <laughs> <laughs> Some, sometimes they let the sun shine on Next my face. Next year when we do the rollout, <laughs> I'll invite you to come and we'll do something in the boardroom. That's a beautiful building. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting you, you prefaced it by saying that question of where would you want to be in terms of articulating this this message. And in many ways, if you look at the advantages that the United States has, not just in terms of domestically, and there are obviously challenges, but also internationally, when you look across the sort of the landscape of science, technology, and innovation, we have the, the big brands. And those big brands are actually more and more science and technology driven. They're the platform companies in many ways. We have the universities that, that have not only attracted some of the top talent, but have actually also seeded much of that talent back as they've gone back, as I think was being mentioned by Wayne about some of the, 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 the top students to, and, and uh, researchers going back to countries. So as these issues would come across, and, and a very vast um, amount of expertise within the Department of State, all, almost every time the, the conversation would come up, and, and, and I would say this is always the, the warning, how do we get the next Silicon Valley? 
And I think if anybody actually knew that answer, they wouldn't be getting uh, you know GS fifteen schedule in the, in the <laughs> government. They would be out making the next Silicon Valley all over the world. But it, but it gets to this. I think this broader issue. People want to know how did the U.S. or how do places that have actually created these innovation ecosystems really develop that model? And and I would say that across the world, that was always the number one question that would get asked. People want to engage the United States around innovation ecosystems. They looked at the science technologies. They looked at things like the National Science Foundation and looked at processes and how does that help seed things. Um, they, they looked at entrepreneurs that were, in a lot of ways, even looking like the people that lived in their countries because at one time they or their ancestors lived, lived in those countries. How did that system create? And, and what did it look like? And, and those were often, I think, both great conversations to have, they could also get a little bit frustrating because the answer is there's not a one size fits all, there's not a Silicon Valley that can sprout up everywhere. On the other hand, there's so much innovation, so much uh, potential. I, I had the opportunity to, to travel across much of, much of the world in my time visiting incubators, accelerators, people and, and particularly young people that were looking for ways to take their, their idea and bring it to, and often it was a technology-based idea, and bring it to the market, and use that as a way to not only create economic growth, but also identity for themselves. There's a very strong part of identity. Okay, so Vaughn, um, given what we were just talking about, how should the U.S., is the U.S. doing enough, is the U.S. <coughs> doing enough to enable this or help meet the hopes and aspirations of, of developing countries as it relates to innovation and science technology? And if we're not, what, more could or should we be doing? Sure. So I, I think part of the, it, it gets fairly definitional. When we say, is the U.S.? Yes. Well, the U.S. is a lot of things. And the U.S. is, you know, everything from a, a fairly sizable federal government to a very diverse set of universities and colleges. 50 to, states. To, to 50 states and Washington, D.C. And companies. And, and, companies and, and all those different things. And so I would say, different parts of the US ecosystem are doing more, and some parts are doing not as much as maybe they could do. And I will say one of the things that's changed, and so I was, I was you and I worked together yeah. when I was at the State Department in the early 2000s. It was a simpler time. It was a simpler time. It was a simpler time. And, and then to go back from 2015 to 2017, <sighs> to even see a slightly different conversation taking place around the world, which was much more of this recognition that science and technology were the future. And in many ways, that was in no small part because the very people that are in this room, I think the very people that were involved in a lot of these conversations, had not only said it a bunch, but it actually demonstrated it. Yeah, I don't think 15 years ago, like, I think just, let me just underline it. I don't think 15 years ago, if you went to Africa or you went to other parts, even Southeast Asia or even South Asia, I'm not sure this would have been as advanced a conversation or you would have had that conversation. Is that, a, is that a fair statement? I think it's a fair statement. I think part of it is that the, you know, we were talking at lunch. I think the, just the pace and the speed of, of information and technology has changed so much that the, the broader democratization of information is, is wider. You used a term democratization of science and technology. Democratization really. of science and technology. No, it's not it's purely true. democratized, but it's, but it's at least to the point where the even if you just look at just the, the sheer numbers of where basic research is taking place, the, the degree to which it's actually expanding a little bit more beyond the traditional sort of G7 countries. Now, a lot of it is driven by China's massive growth in basic research, but it's other places as well. Countries are beginning more and more to experiment with different modes and modalities for doing basic research. Um, there are lots and lots of companies now that are actually realizing that because Basic research cannot, is not only the highest tech stuff that, that was happening, it's actually doing a lot of coding and a lot of the mathematics that actually underpins a lot of the economy. You're seeing it more distributed. Mm -hmm. Now there are still, and, and that's with the caveat that there are still the major research countries in the world that have a, a huge advantage because they have the pipeline, they have the expertise. You don't go, as, as Terry was saying, you don't go right from you know, somebody wanting to have this great idea to the idea happening. There's this whole piece around, around the science and the engineering pieces of it and the, the transformations that take place. And that does benefit, it's sort, of, it's sort of a stochastic process. It benefits those places that have more. Okay, so Sonal, I first met you 10 years ago and if I think about your career 
Um, you've been in government, you've been at university, and you've been in the private sector. Um, you uh, put a lot of, you've also, outside of your work, been involved in standing up something called Indicor that I hope you'll talk a little bit about. So uh, this conversation is very relevant to your career, and you've walked your talk. So uh, thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, first of all, congratulations on this report. I know uh, I had a chance to flip through it uh, before coming uh, in the last couple of days, and I have to say, you captured a lot of information in something that's not 300 pages, which Thank is what you. a university would do. So congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> We're gonna have the anime version's coming out in a few weeks. But yeah. but then, uh, um, Thank you. I think, uh, you know, it's been great to have seen innovation from multiple spaces. So uh, having worked at Google and at Goldman Sachs and then at, um, in the government, and I think a, a little bit of what Vaughn talked about, I mean, there's a role for government. There's also a role for others outside of government. So whether government is the convener of the conversation. But I also think, let me just start with, I think we need to reframe what we think the solutions are and who's in the lead at what time. So it may not be that the government is always the leader in solutions. The government might be the convener. The government might be a data platform. The government might be um, the risk taker. But it might not be seen as you know, what we thought government should be. And we have to rethink a little bit of that. We have to change our language between government and private sector. Like, uh, and, I, and I agree with Terry that there's probably more happening with, the gov um, with private sector and academia. But I work in academia. And I got to tell you, it's not easy <laughs> um, to convince the private sector at the pace at which academia moves and the pace at which mm -hmm. the private sector has to move today are not the same. So we need to realign timelines. We need to realign language as to what the outcomes are that we're looking for, what time frames can we get it. We also need to realign expectations. I mean, industry is great until they don't share data. Mm -hmm. right? So if you want to do research, it's great. But Google, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, they don't want to share data. I mean, you see this playing out with the election stuff right now, right? Is that they don't want to share their data. So in the past, when, it, and when an academic institution used to do research, you had access to data so you could actually do research. Now you're signing seven NDA agreements with seven different institutions in order to do research, of which I can't combine the data sets of mm. two organizations because the NDAs don't allow that to happen. So how do you do research that provides you valuable information when you're signing these agreements in different places. So we need to re realign expectations a little bit and what it means to share information, not publicly, but for research purposes. And then finally, I'd say I think, and I, I think Terry mentioned this in, the, on time, in part of the government. The government has a huge role to play. I just don't think government knows what its role is anymore. <laughs> um, what is it a regulatory role? Is it a management role? Is it a convening role? And I think there's an opportunity to have this conversation. Um, and we tried this, you know, I think the last three governments have actually been trying to do some of this. I don't think it's just been one. It's that we've never had the explicit conversation of what is the role of government. We have this explicit conversation of experimentation. So every agency within the government tries a bunch of little things here and there. But there's no explicit conversation of what is the role of government to be in this role and how do we want to use it effectively. So I, I'd say, I'd think about it. And the last question you asked me about was um, IndyCorps. We started a nonprofit 15 years ago that was taking people of Indian origin back to India to work on projects. And I think what we learned from that is the diaspora has a lot to offer. I think Wayne talked about it a little bit in, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the Philippines and the two examples that he gave. And I don't know that we know how to use the diaspora. We tend to want it for money. <laughs> yeah. We tend to want it for events. So, hey, you got invited to this White House event on this, and we had a bunch of diaspora there. It's great. <laughs> but what we, we haven't- We need 50 diaspora to show up. Right. And, and what we haven't done very well is to understand that the diaspora, I mean, I just look at the Indian community, which is where I come from, some of the top tech CEOs are all of Indian origin, and we haven't even leveraged that properly. We're, we're, yeah. we're, we're not even sure how to use it, and we're not even sure how to have that conversation. But those diaspora are having conversations with the Indian government. Mm -hmm. And we don't even understand that conversation um, right now. And I just know this from, from the world that I live in. All the stuff that the Indian government's currently doing on demonetization, you can bet those tech companies are in there talking to that government on how to use blockchain how to use, do different types of uh, financing yeah. through, through technology. And we don't even know that. 
Or say with the national ID conversation. Yeah, and the national ID, the Aadhaar conversation. Like, we're not even in that conversation. And so I think this question we need to figure out is like, what is the role of the diaspora, not just as a funding mechanism or an event mechanism, but there's a lot of information that the diaspora has and thinks differently about because they know how to operate in uncomfortable environments. Mm -hmm. And they're very good at it. Yeah. <laughs> so how would you leverage that information effectively to understand how to operate differently? So let me just, um, you've also been in philanthropy and you've been in finance. And I know you also thought about this in your past life in government, but um, one of the conversations is about, is a conversation around money. And, and so how, how should, where's the, if you're a development agency or you're a philanthropy, is there a role for, what, what's the role for catalytic financing and what, what does that look like? Um, there's a lot of role for catalytic financing. Yes. We just gotta figure out what we're trying to solve for. Right. Um, I think the challenge with financing is everybody's like, where's the money? And not what's the problem we're trying to solve. So maybe we start with, hey, if what we're trying to do is help the Philippines finance for clean energy, mm then there's people that would put money into pot, pot, pots of money for clean energy financing because they're interested in that. But what we start with is how much money can we get? And then we think about what the instrument is that somebody <laughs> comes into. And I, th I just think we just need to, it's a different way of thinking about the problem, which is what is it we're trying to solve for? I know a lot of diaspora, right, that are currently financing in Kenya and in India and in different places that are spending their time saying, hey, we care about mobile payments for clean energy. Hey, we care about um, you know, doing these finance mechanisms for, for um, education and we will pay for that. But, and they're putting money in and they're willing to put financing in as our corporates we have to think about it from the perspective of where's the solution, who's trying to solve for it, and maybe it doesn't look like an American solution. No. Maybe it looks like an Indian solution that has a different financing mechanism, and maybe we need to work within that, but it might not be the American solution that finances the way the Americans would. And I, you're seeing this around the world that's happening, whether you're in South Africa, whether you're in India, whether you're in Ghana, it's all over the world, and we just need to reframe our thought on development. <laughs> into thinking about where are the countries and what do they want and how do they operate versus what is it we want them to do and can we keep doing it the way we've been doing it. We, what I like call, I call that chicken or beef development. Yeah. We got chicken or beef and they said, oh, I want an ice cream sundae, I want creme brulee. No, 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 I got chicken or beef, right? Yeah, they, right. exactly. Yeah. And we keep offering chicken and beef. Chick I got chicken or beef. <laughs> and Thank if you, you have money to finance it, that would be great. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Phil. Uh, love your books. I think everyone should go out and read them. But I think uh, for this conversation, um, you've, you've thought about innovation in developing nations and innovation-led economic growth as part of, you, as part of your, your career. Um, can you just talk about the policy environment that you need in terms of, we've talked about outside governments, but let's talk about developing country governments and the kinds of policies they need. And Terry talked a little bit about this as well, but what are the kinds of enabling policies that developing country governments need to, to have in place to enable innovation-led economic growth? Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me. Thanks for mentioning the books, including, <laughs> including the code economy of 40,000-year history. Which I, I, which which I read, out. Yes, which that, I liked. That was supposed to be a laugh grabber. But anyway, yeah. I read and liked. That is the name of the book. Um, and so, um, you know, as we were downstairs talking about this and thinking about this event in advance. I mean, you, you talked about um, definitions in the beginning, overused yeah. words, um, and uh, Vaughn referred to this as well. I mean, innovation, um, you know, to me is just making a better idea happen. Um, disruptive innovation, which is very important for this discussion, is making a better idea happen and really pissing some people off along the way. Um, and that's important because disruptive innovation is going to uh, encounter obstacles in ways that other forms of innovation um, won't. So um, as far as what developing countries need, the first point is I think this is a very important point um, for everybody here and elsewhere in this country is that all countries are developing countries. Um, there are richer countries. Uh, there are poorer countries, there are countries with more and less infrastructure, uh, but all countries are developing countries and that's more you know, evident every, every day. 
Um, all countries need both types of these innovations. You need them for, for different reasons. The first category um, it, it, where it's not necessarily disruptive is just about learning and adaptation. Um, and um, you know, all countries, all institutions, all people uh, need to learn and adapt uh, on a routine basis. Everybody realizes this, this is not a novel insight, but it is absolutely essential. Disruptive innovation is essential for a different reason, because not because necessarily creates economic growth, um, uh, certainly not because it creates jobs, because it's not at all clear that innovation is a net job creator anymore, um, at least not in the near term, um, and, and, and really not because it brings new te technology to market, although that's nice. Uh, disruptive innovation is essential because it, it's, it's the core of economic dynamism, of economic vitality, mm -hmm. that, that economies that, that aren't alive then die. And economies are organic entities. And so what, what disruptive innovation does is it, it, it allows for the sort of recombination and repurposing of underutilized assets. And the more dynamic the environment, the more essential that is. So, um, so, so, so um, in terms of practically speaking, um, we know what a developing country should do, and again, this is every country. Um, the number one thing to do is stop doing bad things. <laughs> Um, if you stop doing bad things, it, it's different. You know, to do clever things is, is great, <laughs> but to st stop doing bad things is, is is a really good start. And 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 so in most places, that means one one version of that is favor incumbents less. Yeah. Um, and you know, the notion of government facilitating innovation um, is almost by definition a little bit oxymoronic when it comes to dis disruptive innovation because government is an assemblage of representatives of incumbent actors of various types. So innovation to the extent that it undermines the power of incumbent actors is going to be hostile to those interests that any government represents. It's just going to be different categories of disruptors that are represented in government at any point in time. So, so it's not at all easy or obvious to think about government disrupting innovation, but if anybody has a vantage point, they have some agency within government, and they can say, you know what, we need to open up some playing field. We need a clearing in this rainforest. We need to let some big rotting trees fall so that then you know, the organisms in the atmosphere can go to work and create new things. And then that won't last for very long, and there'll be pushback or whatever, but it's turned out over you know, a few hundred years that it works. I mean that this sort of, you know, dialect or whatever back and forth between people who want to clear new spaces and people who want to oppose it, you know, that, that, it's, that it does maintain economic vitality. Um, more purposefully, I think that what government can do now, and there's a whole array of things that can be done purposefully, but I think Sonal brought up, uh, you know, Adhar, and uh, you know, we were talking earlier about you know, digital India and the development of the India stack, and um, you, you know, there's, there, it's interesting. I've been watching the sort of the dynamics around the Modi government, and particularly around digital India initiative, um, and there seem to be very, you know, well considered uh, critiques of the Modi government that they're not moving fast enough. They're really, you know, that they're not really taking on the big challenges, and others saying that they've moved irresponsibly fast, for example, with GST implementation and you know, other kind of really dramatic recent reforms. So I, I don't have any point of view of that. That's not my area of expertise. But, but I would say that the, the, the notion of really changing the, the infrastructure of a society at the fundamental level, beginning with digital IDs, which of course began under the previous government, and then the Modi government has not only embraced, but have actually expanded rather dramatically, and then, and then demonetization and GST reform and I think there will be more. So I, you know, I think actually that's an example of a government purposefully building a platform of opportunity. Maybe not perfectly, maybe not quickly enough, maybe too quickly, I don't really know. But I think the aspiration of that is exactly the same type of thing that government can do. And I think it has potential to be really profound. I'm taking yeah. his class. Sorry? I'm taking his class. Yeah. <laughs> it's obviously not a gut. But, <laughs> right? so, but uh, Paul, Paul sorry, sorry, Phil, could you just, just for a minute talk about um, We've done some things here on the fourth industrial revolution, and there's different components of that. It includes artificial intelligence and drones and advanced materials and blockchain uh, and driverless cars. Now, there are two schools of thought about the fourth industrial revolution. One is this is really scary, and it's going to be different this time. And this is going to be so disruptive, it's going to have all sorts of, dis it's going to have all sorts of distortive effects on societies. And um, another is is that if we, we need to somehow we need to embrace this and we need to we need to embrace this change. I suspect you're in the 
the latter. So, how, you know, if someone said, I'm worried about, I'm, I'm fearful about this, this massive change, there's a term Danny Roderick uses called uh, uh, premature deindustrialization, which in essence is, is a fancy term for if you've had tens of millions of people leaving villages and, and getting into factory work and then kind of moving from there, if that ladder gets kicked away because of robots are making the clothes as opposed to people working in textile factories, et cetera, or um, other kinds of you know high high end robotics that are going to do all sorts of things. What, how 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 what would your what's your answer to that? Well, what's your response to that? Uh, I mean, the first thing is that it, it, it's important to take this appropriately seriously, and I think that this you know sort of whole discussion about robots are taking our jobs, and um, and then this a separate but serious issue of you know um, of premature deindustrialization you were just referred to. I mean these are these are really serious and 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 to some extent really novel challenges. Um, I mean I've had the you know good fortune over the last decade to be associated on and off, sometimes formally, sometimes informally, with the Kauffman Foundation yeah. in Kansas City, and um, uh, you know under uh, the leadership of uh, Bob Lighton, head of research. There there for, for many years, my friend Dane Stangler and others, um, Coffin really do, uh, you know, brought to the fore you know, very important research on, on the importance of high growth firms to, to economic growth and the disproportionate um, uh, you know, a contribution of, small, of, of new and growing firms uh, you know, to, to job creation and so forth. Problem with that, and I think all of us who did this work you know, understand it very well, is that, that, it, that it missed something very important, which is that um, Scale up innovation only gets you so far. Um, and you need, at the same time that you have scale up innovation, which was the high growth firms things, really like, you know, the sort of skyscrapers in New York City, like literally scale up innovation, build the peaks higher, you know, um, that, that, that you miss scale out innovation. And scale out innovation is creating opportunity for as many people as possible. And the one doesn't follow from the other. They're both important. We know we, we have a lot of institutions that are, that are fine-tuned to scale up innovation. We've barely even started to think about what an institution for scale out innovation might be. Now, I would say, for example, just one example, I maybe could be able to come up with a better one. Um, you know, eBay is not a bad example, yeah. right? It's a platform that created a lot of opportunity for people to, you know, find livelihoods, sometimes as hobbyists, sometimes, you know, uh, as jobs, but basically they connect with each other and, you know, in a horizontal way, created a lot of opportunity. I think that's, I was excited about your blockchain event. I think blockchain, you know, has some potential to create large numbers of such opportunities, whether it's that technology or any other peer-to-peer -peer transactional technology that allows for, you know, scale out innovation. I mean, I'm hopeful there, um, but, um, I, th I think that, that, that we need a lot of them. Um, I'm particularly fascinated and interested with the notion of, um, and you know, as, as, as you know, with uh, digital property records and the digitization of property records around the world. So every country in the world over the next 10 to 20 years is going to be upgrading their cadastral system, their property management systems. We should that's start a company. What's that? We should start a company. Well, yeah, yeah. We that's talk about that offline. Disclaimer, I do have a company that's working right. on this. Um, <laughs> but, but, but I got into the company because I was working on with Bob and others and, and so forth and so on. So anyway, so, so in, in any given country, a small country will spend $300 million on the digitization of its property records. Um, property records around the world are almost overwhelmingly land, I mean, uh, paper-based and centralized. Um, and so, so this is inevitable because it's just part of the digitization of work. The question is, and the reason we started our company is, can we use that process of digitizing property records as a kind of like digital Marshall plan? I mean, if you're going to spend $100 billion globally, right, in digitizing records, you can do it with drones, you can do it with satellite imaging. I mean, all the technologies that exist basically to automate this, it's very powerful technologies, and you would want to use them. But it also creates an opportunity, just sort of like smallpox eradication did, um, you know, in, in a previous generation in the, in the domain of public health, to train tens of millions of people in literally every corner of the world, because there is land everywhere, um, to do this work. And so I think that those types of opportunities, and of course, then you have an infrastructure of, of land management that then unlocks opportunities on top of that in all sorts of ways. So we just need to find a lot more of those. Great. You've been a very patient audience. I know there are a lot of thoughtful people here. I'd love to hear from this audience. And I'm happy to call on people that I know, too. <laughs> so, OK, let's start with this gentleman up here. Introduce yourself. 
Yeah, thank you. I'm John Coonrod with The Hunger Project. Um, and part of, I think, this last point Phil was making about scaling out, particularly in terms of things like social safety nets and uh, other innovations in cushioning some of this disruption for the poorest people in the world. Um, there are lots of experiments out there. Um, and I was curious as to what you all see are some of the most encouraging innovations in, um, in social safety nets. Right. Hmm. The, you know, I'll, let me take a start with that. One, one of the things I've found that's interesting about social safety nets is that there's, go back to my point about this isn't your grandparents' developing world, there's been a quintupling of the amount of taxes collected in the last 15 years. When I started, when I was in government in the year 2000, working, or 2002, I was at, the State Department, at AID and Obama was at the State Department. Um, there was about, let's see if I get the statistics right here. There was about $100 billion of taxes collected in Africa by African countries, the 54 Sub-Saharan African countries, and about $30 billion of foreign aid, mas o menos, something along those lines. By 2013, there was $60 billion, a doubling of foreign aid in Africa, and there had gone to, six, to $500 billion, or $600 billion of taxes collected. So that means that there's an increasing number of countries, not just in lower middle income countries, but even in poor countries, that are experimenting with various forms of social safety nets. And um, they're learning from countries, whether it's Brazil or Mexico, or two countries in particular, and they're applying new technologies. One of the components of having a social safety net is to have a personal or digital identity. And I think one of the reasons, there are many reasons to have digital identities, but that one of the reasons I think the Indian government is, is, is embarking on this is is, is partially around a social safety net you know, assumption, yeah. but there are other reasons to do it, voting, or also it prevents people from being trafficked. So there's, also, so there's, a, is there's more money, there's more capable governments, and there's more and more ubiquitous technology. So I think there's an, ex, there's an increasing practice, and there's an increasing proliferation of safety nets around the world. So I do think that, um, I do think it's certainly a function of, um, it's a role for government, uh, though, and I do think that um, there's certainly roles for government. We also talked a little bit about that, and I think that's one role for government, which is to, to kind of be a, a cushion, but I do think for countries to move up the, the chain, you certainly need that, that safety net, but you need the sorts of things that Terry was talking about earlier in terms of saying, okay, well, I mean, I, I didn't think there was going to be a National Science Foundation in Indonesia, but I don't think that's the only example. So I think governments are, are being more capable. And one way in they're being more capable is, is also investing in not only in their people, but also in, in, in education and science as well. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a function. It's certainly a function of government that's, that's important. And so it, you, you are seeing a lot of that. And I think that's an interesting, an interesting topic. So others? Yes? Okay, Lori Rowley, please, from Luger Center. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having the program. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yes, Lori Rowley with the Luger Center. Dan, I was interested in your comment on chicken or beef, and your comment as well, Son, all about how, yeah, chicken or beef, but they really wanted an ice cream sundae. Mm. Um, <laughs> I work a lot on um, some aid effectiveness reform issues, one of which is on country ownership. Uh, local ownership of what the resources should be and where the investment should go. And I'm curious about what you all think the biggest hurdle is to allowing that to actually happen and, and bring this innovation along a, a more quickly. And then secondly, those of you who work on the ground, do you see other countries doing this piece better than the U.S. does? Sorry, aid? Yeah, uh, country-led, hearing what the locals really want, and then working with them in partnership to achieve the goals. So, so let, me, let me start with, let me, thank you, Lori, that's great. So I'm going to start with uh, Vaughn. So could you just talk about how is China doing in terms of supporting innovation? Are they, are they, a, are they a soft power competitor, if I can put it that way, in, to this conversation? I think they're a different power competitor. And I, I think that when you look, it, sort of across the board, a, a lot of the, the drivers for how, how that engagement is going around, and I'll, I'll use science and technology as an example, 
are really driven by having some access to quid pro quo is a little bit of a strong term, maybe transactional is probably the better, the better term. In terms of thinking about a transactional relationship, if we provide this, we get that. That said, one of the things that has been very interesting to watch over the last, I'd say about 10 years, has been the increasing degree to which China has recognized that the US model of actually training a lot of the science and engineering community, I'll use that community, because and having them actually going back to their countries and being influencers in their countries is actually a model that is, is potentially valuable for them too. So they're giving out many more scholarships, many more scholarships for, uh, particularly in Africa, some of the, the top bright African students to come to China for some period of time to train in science and engineering at some of their, their top universities, but also some of their non-top universities. I think if you look at it, the, a little bit of the model looks a little bit more like saying, those that can figure out and who are really able to figure out how to get to the United States or have the other things, they're gonna go to the MITs. And we're not gonna get that crowd, but we're gonna get a larger and broader group and we can pay for that. And hopefully have that group then go back, A, they learn the language, but B, they end up going back and becoming leaders in some of the universities. I've been in a number of the universities in a number of different countries in Africa and they say, look, we were all trained in either Canada or the United States with some model. The next generation is now getting trained in China and that's gonna have impact on how that university Ugh. is developed over time. So the, could I, let me, may, I'd be curious, let me just, Vaughn, let me just take advantage of your presence. Let me ask you about Japan or Europe. Do they, how do they fit in this, to, a little bit to, to Lori's question? How do, they, how do they play in this conversation? No, I mean, so J Japan obviously has a, a long history through JICA and other programs to, to put more money out there. One of the things that I think they are, they are focusing on more and more is, the, is a demographic challenge they have. They just don't have the numbers of people in their workforce to do lots of things. So they, they're, they are developing a much more robust, again, very much in Africa. If you look at the whole TCAD process that they, that they are sort of running through, they actually held one of the TCAD meetings in Kenya last year as a way to engage much more broadly with Africa. I think they are looking at a lot of different ways to engage um, with the science and engineering communities in some of these, these countries. That said, I do think this is a place where automation and robotics is actually, you know, if you look at the different, the different models for development, for internal development, it's either increase the numbers of people in the work pool by expanding it out to broader groups that were maybe not as involved in the workforce. Second would be bringing in people from outside or the third one is to increase the amount of automation and robotics. And I think very much heavily invested in number three, thinking about number one, but that engagement internationally, sorry, one was expanding the numbers, increasing the numbers of women in the workforce and other things. Number two is bringing in more immigration, mm -hmm. less so. And the third one being automation. But, but the expansion outward into, into particularly Southeast Asia and for historical reasons, but also into Africa is actually increasing. And it's not just through JICA, they're doing other things through their Japanese science and technology organizations and pieces like that to engage further outward. Okay, so I wanna hear from uh, Sonal and Phil and Terry. I wanna re slightly reframe Lori's first question. Um, I think I'm gonna get at what you're getting at, uh, which is if, if Mark Green was here or Jim Kim was here or the head of the Asian Development Bank was here or the president of JICA was here and they just heard this conversation and implicit in this discussion is that we're gonna have to offer different things. We're gonna have to, if we wanna enable innovation-led economic growth, there's gonna be other sorts of either advice or other sorts of convening power or other sorts of financing mechanisms or other sorts of investments. What would be one or two things that come to mind? You, may, you don't have to have the answer. You don't have to have a silver bullet because they're not necessarily a silver bullet. There may be silver buckshot or silver bullets, <laughs> but there's no silver bullet. But what, what, if you had, a, you had five minutes based on this conversation, what would you tell the senior leadership at the, if you taught Mark Green here or you had Jim Kim here, what would you suggest to help see more innovation-led economic growth happen in in developing countries that aren't, don't happen to be OECD countries. How about that, to, to Phil? So let me start with you. Um, one, I think in a lot of countries, innovation's already happening. Yes. So us pretending like we know what's going on in other countries, we should just 
barely get, get our heads out of the sand a little bit. Yep. Um, that was and, what I saw with this, this yeah, work. Yeah, with your yep. examples yep. that you yep. have in your report. Yeah. So accelerate it. So rather than, and the ecosystem work that everybody's been talking about, like accelerate those ecosystems and invest in that, not the let's assess it, let's give them more technical assistance, let's, you know, where do they actually need technical assistance for acceleration, not just more technical assistance. So, you know, I was, when I was at Google, we'd always get to these SME things and people were like, more technical <laughs> assistance. And I'm like, no, bad financing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to get to the financing problem, not to the technical assistance problem, or the way the banks are looking at credit risk. Maybe that's where we need to go, but instead we start with, and we continue to use these bad models of more technical assistance will give them more access to finance. But what we haven't figured out is the rules of the game in finance have changed, and we're not helping rechange those rules to assessing credit risk differently. But we haven't changed that. We're just constantly changing. The, we use the same tool. So accelerate and rethink those models and what, what this technology offers us to do and AI offers us to do. We think about AI as robots taking jobs, but we never think about AI as using information differently to allow us to look across and say, how do we do credit risk differently? How do we finance differently? What are the risk models that we should be looking at? All of that we don't think about as AI. We think about it only as robots taking jobs. So think about AI in a whole different model of how do I take government data and rethink the use of that data or other data and allow us to do acceleration of innovation and how do we actually spend, and I think you asked this question earlier, Dan, of risky dollars in actually accelerating those systems and how do we pool dollars from the public, private, and, and, and the sectors to actually make that happen, because that's what's going to happen. It's not going to be the government that's going to come up with, mm. the, with the, tech, the, the early dollars. It's going to have to be public and private in some, some ways to make that happen. So I think that's, in some cases, it's already happening. And in, in places like in parts of Africa or like Rwanda, the government's already taking leadership in that. In India, the government and the private sector, frankly, is already doing that, because they have to spend 2% on CSR now, so they're, they're, they're thinking about CSR in a whole different way. But I think that's where the opportunities are, so accelerate those, because what happens with developing countries is they watch each other. So if they see someone else doing it, they're gonna go send people to say, how did you do that, and how do we make that happen? And that, I, I don't think it's gonna be a top-down mm. approach, I think it's gonna be a much more networked approach of how accelerated innovation happens, is people are gonna watch each other and think, figure out how to do it, it's, because information is readily available. Mm. That's not our problem. So we have this model of linear, we're here and we're gonna tell everybody how to do it, but what if it's like this, and we have to figure out how that network is gonna connect with each other, and that's where I think the opportunity is. And one final thing I'd say, I think sometimes we think about technology, and to your point about social safety nets, we don't think about the role of technology in actually improving social safety nets. We only yeah. think about technology as needing to solve for a problem when it happens, but if you could just combine data systems from education and health, you would have much more information on how to provide social safety nets better. If you could take all of the seven types of ways you get access to social safety nets today and use one common infrastructure platform and one common definition of what that data looks like, we would actually have more information and able to get more money to people than going to eight agencies to get whatever you need. It'd be it's much just a more waste efficient. of money. Yeah. It'd be much more efficient. So let's think about technology in, in the way that actually improves services as opposed to replacing or the need for services, because those always exist, but we don't think about the use of technology for improving that service delivery. I, 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 I totally, totally agree with you. And along those lines, I, I think one of the things you hear about in the technology piece, which I, I think is a little bit concerning, is this idea of, oh, once the robots take all the jobs, or once AI takes all the jobs, government's job is to distribute that money for people to go have leisure. Yeah. And in fact, I, I'm available. I, I was just going to, I, I, I was ready to go. I mean, I, 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 I hope this is not recorded, but that's actually the wrong approach. What, what government should be doing is taking that money and investing it into into the training of people for the next generation of jobs that you won't even know what they are yet. Yeah. But if it's just sort of this idea of, well, you know, we'll just let them take all the jobs and just sit back. Mm -hmm. I have kids for that reason. I want my kids to take care of me. I'm, I'm ready to, so, so it's, it's, that, it's that piece. And we don't have new models for job training. And we don't, exactly right. right. We're using exactly the same right. old models for job training. I would argue that of the five of us on this panel, at least, at least in one job in your career has, was a job that didn't really exist before you, before you had the job. If you think, of, if you think about, I, I can think of at least three in my case. So. Uh, and I know that in the future that's going to be, I, but I want to hear from t Terry and, and Phil about this. So I, I want to 
take, taking, I won't take, taking Lori's question, slightly re repackaging <laughs> it, but, but so if you had Mark Green here or Jim Kim, Terry, and given the work you do at RTI, and given this conversation, what, what, how should the World Bank or how should AID, how should, what, how, what should they be doing differently based on this conversation? I, I think the thing I've learned from looking at these projects at, at around the world is that we need to take each one individually and make an assessment of what their needs are. Mm -hmm. Because you can't, there is not even silver buckshot. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so different of the kinds of things that are going on. In one place, it may be the research funding. In another place, it may be developing the innovation networks. But in others, it's just access to higher education yeah. um, that's going to make the huge effort. Or it's, I mean, there's just so many, it's electrification. You know, yeah, that's interesting. Electricity to certain parts of a country. Well, one of the, we were talking about several things at lunch. One was you need uh, there's several things if you want to participate in the innovation economy. You need to have a literate, <laughs> literate workforce. You need a numerate workforce. Uh, you need to be able to have to think creatively. You can't just have sort of rote learning. You need electricity and power. You need access to the internet. Someone used the term access to digitization. So I think uh, to Terry's point, there's a whole series of sort of basic building blocks or ingredients to fully participate in this, mm -hmm. in the innovation-led economic growth economy. Is that, that yes, fair? Absolutely. And in each individual country, you have to go in there and figure out what it's going to mean for them. Thank you. Okay, so Phil, so if Mark Green was here or Jim Kim was here and they said, okay, if I could, if I could rethink how I put my people, time, and money into stuff uh, based on this conversation, what would you tell them? Well, so first of all, I made reference to aid effectiveness. I think that is an important question. I'm not uninterested in that question, but I think the real question now is, is um, this is just a data question, uh, um, is aid relevance? Um, I mean, we're already in a world where diaspora, uh, where um, remittances are twice all of foreign aid. Um, if we engage diaspora in investing in their home countries, then it could easily be 5x, 6x all development assistance. And that's, and, and diaspora goes person to person, right? Whereas we know, uh, you know, not everything that happens when we have an aid project goes in country to the people it's supposed to benefit. We just leave it at that. That's the aid <laughs> effectiveness part. So um, then uh, with, with uh, Jim Kim of the World Bank, I mean, and I, again, I've said this to an aid World Bank audience. I, I mean this with, you know, as an evidence of my deep respect for the people who, the people who are at the World Bank. Um, I think one thing you would consider doing, and this is the benchmark for the effectiveness of the World Bank, is to just shut down suddenly shut down everything overnight without warning, right? This is getting kind of personal. No, 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 I'm just, no, 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 no. I'm no. getting out there. No, I got to pay my mortgage, come on. That, that's exactly my point. That's exactly my point. So what would happen? Well, who works at the World Bank? Some of the most talented, brightest people from all over the world with the highest aspirations, people with just incredible drive to, you know, make the world a better place, right? And suddenly they're stuck. They're stuck without a job. They got kids, you know, going to St. Albans. Who knew? You know, who knows where else they're going? Um, and you know, hey, they've got. A I mean, come on, Phil. No, 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 no. So, 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 what's the evidence for this? Well, if you look at if you look at innovation, regional innovation around the world, the one formula that has the only formula that's worked consistently is spend heavily in a particular region on R and D, in particular research and development. That's point number one. Uh, now, particularly military R and D. Point number mm. one is spend a lot. And second, stop suddenly, right? <laughs> Silicon Valley, late 1950s, US, uh, San Diego, and uh, Northern Virginia in the 1980s, you've yeah. seen the same intervals in Israel, that, that suddenly all these people, they liked Northern California, all those radio engineers, right? And then there were these sudden budget cuts at the end of the Korean War, very sudden budget cuts, um, and, 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 and they had to find other things to do. They became entrepreneurs, they innovated. So, so we've got to think about as compared with the incredible There's a role creative of necessity, energy the that world would be of necessity. released if the World Bank was just shut down tomorrow, can the World Bank live up to that? And I don't think they're doing it. I don't think they're close to doing it. I don't it. like this thought exercise but, at all. But, but <laughs> if they were to do it, I think that one thing that they could do that, 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 that countries can't do themselves is, again, invest in digital platforms. Well, I, I think that's a, thank you, Phil, for that. I think that's really interesting because I think about, I go back to the Research Triangle origin story. Yeah. And I think they said to themselves, we can't, we can't get to where we're going just on tobacco. And what are we going to do? And so a little bit to your point that, there is a, there's a component of necessity in channeling energy 
for to necessity require is is, re is somewhat required for for, for progress. It's mother so, invention. Mother invention. Okay. Yeah. I do, let, Vaughn, let me, let me, I didn't ask you this question, so let me just take advantage of the fact you've been in government a couple of stints. So, um, so let me ask you this question as well. Okay, so if you're uh, Mark Green or you're Jim Kim, what would you say to them if they say, in addition to shutting it down, um, what, which I, thumbs down on that, but, but, <laughs> but, but, but what, would you, what would you say they should be doing in terms of people time, like, given the kinds of conversation you're having in your la most recent job? I guess a barbecue at their house is in order, right? Yes, <laughs> well, yeah, yes. A thank you and farewell. Yes. Um, you know, I think I think it started actually during during your tenure, and I'll, I'll look at it from USAID, which is really trying to figure out how how a development agency can I think exactly right think of themselves as different from the traditional models of development, yeah. and think of them more in that role of of catalyzing those things that should be catalyzed, finding the things that are working and do more of those, yeah. and find the things that are not working and don't do them. I think that's exactly, I mean, I think that's well, exactly. And I have to qualify, look, yeah. I mean, yeah. I didn't really, because the, the point is that if you did, yes, if you did the dismantle hard. the World Bank, you would be sorry. Because yeah. there are unique capabilities. Well, he'd be sorry. No, I, no, we'd all be sorry. sorry. <laughs> we'd all be sorry. But there, yeah. I, I got a business to run here. Come on. There are things that they can do that, exactly that, right. that others can't do. Exactly Those right. are the things they should do. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, and, sorry to interrupt. And, but no, I, I think, and I think that's exactly right. And I think the, the challenge sometimes is there will, be, there will always be an entrepreneurial group that will push out the edges all the time. Right. And the question is, how do you have those structures, those, those institutions that are are allowing for the system to remain solid and to exist so that you can actually get the flares that come out out of that. And I think that's a big piece of it. I mean, this gets to the R&D funding. Yes, I think, I mean, as a scientist, I'll say, there's always times to sort of cut certain amounts of budget that you can see. But the reality is you have to keep some steady state of budget in place because you don't know where that next idea is gonna come from. And in some ways, you have to keep funding the platform. Those, that platform is the students that may or may not go off and do something. You don't build, and you also, you don't build a firehouse when there's a fire. You actually have to have that institution in place. But I think, I mean, I think that's what science does well, is that they're constantly looking mm -hmm. ahead and saying, where else do we need to be thinking about? I think sometimes what happens in the social sector is we get comfortable yeah. doing the same things over and over and over and over yeah. again. So I think, I would only add to your point in saying, Yes, we started it, we funded it, we scaled it. When do we get out? Yeah, I think that's I right. I mean, I look at the IFC right now, and I'm right. like, the IFC is funding infrastructure in developing countries that the private sector can pay for, and it's just buying down risk for a bunch of people that shouldn't be bought down risk for. And so, like, if that's really what success looks like, is like, let's do development because they're going to do what the private sector is doing, then why are you there? That's, that's I, I do think it's risk, the, the challenge which is going to happen in a lot of this is, in that R&D <laughs> standpoint, it's oftentimes the very rich universities that yes. have that because yes. they have that ability to yes. to take some of that risk because they've got an alumni base that's given them money yes. or they've got overhead or they've got other things. It's harder at the margins where it's really. And, yeah, but I think and the I think government's right great though. at doing that on the science yes. side. That's my point. I yeah. think NSF. Um, NIH, I think they look across and they're like, what problem should we be looking at in 10 years from now? Um, we don't have that in the social sector. Like, where, where are you thinking about what's the job training program of the future and where's that research coming from? Because we're still funding that crappy job training program that's teaching people Microsoft Word. So, just, you know, I do that, think. Tweet that. Tweet that. <laughs> just the, the I, I do think this issue of Vaughn's point about where are people going to study? Whenever I go to a developing country, I always ask, where are your elites going to school? Where, where do you send your students? Do you send them to the UK? Do you send them to Japan? I'm always, I always want to know if they're going to send them to China. That always gets my attention, <laughs> and I, I, I prefer they come here, so frankly. I mean, I'm just putting my cards on the table. So I, think, I, I, don't, so I think that it is an important part of our soft power. Mm -hmm. I want as many people coming to the United States as possible and studying at NC State. I want them studying at University of North Carolina. I want them studying at Virginia Tech. I want them, you know, I want, because that is, that is an unbelievable multiplier. It's hard, it's, I don't think we've fully, I don't think we've fully measured it. I don't think we fully understand it as a, as a, a form of soft power, but I think I agree with Vaughn that the Chinese have gotten the joke that this is like a really important thing. And, but if I have to choose, I'd rather they come here than go somewhere else. That's, that's my personal preference. And I'm, just, just Terry, could I just, before I open up to one other, one other question, could you just talk about having been at the university, like at, at NC State, how did foreign students, what was the, va what, 
how did how did NC State see the okay. value of of students coming from developing countries? How did they how did they think about them in terms of either either research ideas or in terms of connectivity? How did they think about it from sort of a strategic standpoint? Oh, I mean, it's, especially for research, it's incredibly valuable because it's really the very top students from those countries that are coming because it's not easy for them to come. They can't, you know, it's There are a lot expensive. of hurdles, mm -hmm. a lot of hoops to a jump through. A lot of through. hoops, but it's also expensive. And it's so, expensive. You know, some, in some cases, it's their country that sponsors them, and sometimes it's their parents. There's different mm -hmm. ways, but they all have to, you know, have some kind of sponsorship to come. But I think it's also and interesting, yeah. So what you're looking at is really top students and that are so dedicated to learning and especially science and technology because they see a future there, whereas <coughs> a lot of our American students don't see that. They may think it's like a four-year party or something. Yeah, well. Or hopefully not, but, yeah. but I think, but, but Terry, I think there's the benefits beyond graduating if say they go back home and there's connectivity and they say we're going to do a we want to look at advanced materials in Malaysia and they went to NC State and they'll say well I want to I know there's an engineer or a, a you know a chemical engineer at NC State and I want to partner with that professor because I knew that professor at school right. it's those sorts of personal connections and they speak the language and it's easy and they they're looking for an excuse you know it's nice to come back to where you studied once in a while. There's all sorts of soft reasons, oh, yeah. right? Lots that of enable connections it. that keep happening and then they send their students. Then they send, exactly, then they send their students, right. exactly. So it keeps happening. It's, power, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a virtuous circle. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Okay, this gentleman back here with a red tie. And then I want to hear from Jim Michael. Orange tie, but close enough. <laughs> Orange tie, sorry. Um, the light. <laughs> I'm Greg Shuckman. I'm with the University of Central Florida, so we would like folks ah, to come to Orlando uh, in addition to NC State and Chapel Hill. But this goes directly to your university question. So I had a chance to skim the report, and there was a statistic in there that you cited NBER saying that doubling the number of universities led to a 4% increase in GDP. And so shouldn't that mean that there should be this proliferation of universities, and I guess ostensibly the research universities are talking about, all around the globe. But we also know that higher education is going through its own transformation right now in terms of delivery models, in terms of what higher ed is going to look like in the next 10 or 20 years. So can you put that in perspective? Yep. Thank you. Let me, let me get Jim Michael. Hmm. I'll turn the panel. All right, thank you. Uh, fascinating discussion. Uh, I wanted to ask about the countries that don't have science, technology, and innovation in their national uh, development plans. Uh, Wayne Holden referred to uh, scaling out as well as scaling up, mm -hmm. and I think he was talking about within a society. And I'd like to ask what about reaching the societies that are not interested right now? Uh, in this kind of, of progress that uh, is capable through innovation, where the privileged elites feel threatened by that and are resistant to that, as if the, the you know the tobacco farmers in, in uh, North Carolina one day had said, you know, we're going to stop all of we this. We think this is a bad idea, you know, and had the power to do it. And, and in some countries, they do have the power to do it. They absolutely, and do they do it. Uh, and I just wonder what what thoughts people on the panel have like that. about reaching out toward <laughs> to additional countries to bring more into this mainstream idea about innovation uh, and technology. Mm. Thank you. I think that's great. So, so there's a question about the value and role of the higher education system as an enabler of growth. And I think that would be, a, I'm hoping we can talk a little bit. I think that's a great question. And I think Jim Michael's question about, okay, innovation implies disruption. Innovation implies perhaps challenging interests, or may you know may threaten interests. How do how do how do we navigate that? Because that I think those are I think those are two legitimate, interesting questions. So, if you, each of you could take one or both. And I'm, okay, let me start with Vaughn. Can, can I take that second question? Because I think it's it's a it's a great question and, and something that's it's a huge challenge. But but here's an opportunity. 
I just feel you're wearing, I think you're wearing the Sustainable Development. Is that the Sustainable Development No, goal? is that your no, Global Entrepreneurship no. Week? Global it was Entrepreneurship Global Week, Entrepreneurship Week before it was Sustainable Development Goals, just so saying. I, so, so I can't use that as a peg, but I will. But I will. They kind of took the logo. They've morphed. So, so what's <laughs> interesting is the Sustainable Development Goals, which we haven't, we actually didn't talk yeah, about at lunch, about. we haven't talked about here, but, but I know they're top of mind and heart. Um, one of the things that was really, I think, very um, encouraging about the, the Sustainable Development Goals is that when they created them, when they were finally adopted in, in September of 2015, earlier there was something called the technology facilitation mechanism that was built into them. And technology facilitation mechanism, without getting too sort of wonky on it, put at the heart of meeting the sustainable development goals, science, technology, and innovation. It actually created the platform, the network, that said if you were going to meet your sustainable development goals, you're going to have to view science, technology, and innovation as a core component of this. And every year at the United Nations, there's the high level forum on I, I chaired it with the Kenyan co-chair, mm -hmm. with the Kenyan uh, ambassador to the UN for two years. But the idea was exactly this. How do you reach out not only to those countries that have already done it, or brought, bought into it, but the broader numbers of member states that now have to realize that the conversations around broad development priorities are embedded deeply in what you're doing in the science, technology, and innovation space. And a big piece of that is, recommendations that have come out of this, is if you don't create the innovation ecosystem as a part of that, <coughs> you're actually not going to even be able to get to that point of meeting the, the SDGs. It's going to be, it's, it's, it's not a single SDG. It actually underpins and is the platform for everything else. So I think that's one mechanism for actually increasing that and increasing that engagement. Let me, okay, so Terry, there's been a question about the role of higher education and universities. We've talked about the role of education in innovation, but just talk a little bit further about what is should sh should we be proliferating, growing more universities in the developing world? I mean, certainly we talk about that in the report. But how, what if someone said to you, "I want to create an ecosystem"? Should I just be kind of improving what I got, or should I be expanding the number of schools? What should I, how should I be thinking about un higher education in in innovation? Well, I know there was that statistic in the report that's correlated the number of universities with the GDP. But there was also another statistic in there about the quality of the universities in, I think it was Ghana and Kenya, compared to American universities and um, how low that was. And I would argue you first need to achieve quality universities and then you can think about scaling it out because the quality is mm -hmm. much more important. And it sort of relates back to what you were saying, um, Dan, about the um, students going back. And they need to have those students trained at top-notch universities to bring them back to be the professors for that university. And that's often one of the challenges because those students often don't want to go back. And so mm -hmm. what are the kind of incentives you can create in the countries for them to go back and want to be part of the universities there that may be very poorly resourced. They have a reason for not wanting to go back because the resources aren't there to be able to do research or to be able to do the kind of teaching mm -hmm. or scholarship that they want. So how do you incentivize that? So I would argue that the most important thing is to raise, lift up the quality mm -hmm. of the universities first. Thank you. Okay, Phil, and then I'm gonna, the last one's going to have to show, Sonal, but you, Phil? So quick story that I think um, answers both questions. Um, some people may from, be familiar with this, but I don't think um, it's that, that broadly known. So everything we're talking about originated um, with a report written by Vannevar Bush, who read <laughs> research and development for uh, the US government during World War II, was responsible uh, for the development of the hydrogen bomb, the development of the first digital computer. And he wrote uh, a, a, a report called Science and the Endless Frontier. Right, Vaughn? Yep. That, yeah. And so, so it was 1945, and it you know, led to the creation of the National Science Foundation. The whole notion of supporting science-based innovation in the United States came out of that, and then so that's everything we're talking about. The same year, he wrote an article for the Atlantic called As We May Think, mm -hmm. right? And that envisioned a world in which digital computers, the first of which had just been, actually, I don't think it had quite been created yet, um, it, 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 so, so it hadn't even really, you know, weren't in existence. Um, but he envisioned a world of essentially web pages and hyperlinks and, and sort of, you know, digitized knowledge connecting. And a person, one person who read that was a serviceman in the South Pacific named Douglas Engelbart. And he read this, this paper, you know, it, while, while World War II was still going on. 
Um, and, and it inspired him to envision what the technology of the future might be. Now, Douglas Engelbart, in the end, uh, later on, uh, you know, invented, the, I think it was like Xerox Park, um, invented, or maybe SRI, um, invented mm -hmm. the mouse, and, and you know, the whole kind of way in which we relate to computers was, it was owed to Douglas Engelbart. So, so, so this one paper, uh, and this one year, uh, Vannevar Bush really kind of set the, the, the framework. Um, I think that the answer for the most excluded country, countries is going to be Vannevar Bush's paper for the Atlantic and not in Science and the Endless Frontier. Yeah. I don't think, although universities, I think it's good to have more universities. Billionaires around the world should build universities in their countries the same way the Carnegie's and the rest did here. I think it's going to be a great thing. We should have more in exchange and all that stuff's good. I'm for funding basis research. Every country should have their National Science Foundation. All those things are good. But what's really going to drive it are digital platforms that can be accessed everywhere and and now the worst the worst governed places are the places of greatest opportunity on the outside um, and, and, I, and I'll say an example of that is the Estonian e-citizenship program yes. I mean this is a this is a tremendously visionary thing I think Estonia can and should have a billion citizens um, and those billion citizens in around the world should be part of Estonia's soft power so that they don't disappear a second time which would be bad for everybody, particularly the Estonians. So, so what, and people can basically become e-citizens, become part of the Estonian, uh, you know, sort of polity, and then by association, then gain some of the benefits. They can start companies in Estonia. They can represent themselves as Estonia's uh, uh, citizens of their country and Estonia. So we need to have more of that. And getting back to the World Bank, I think the World Bank can do that kind of thing. I think there's all yeah. kinds of great things the World Bank could do. What I'm saying is it should be big things, transformative things, probably built on digital platforms, open source, open access, creating an open, accessible digital platform of the 21st century. That's what the World okay. Bank should be doing. That's what USAID should be funding. And that's what's going to make a difference for the most excluded countries. That's my feeling. All right, so I'm going to give you the last word. I'm still going to his class. I'm still going uh, to his yeah. class. Uh, yes. I'm yes. taking your class, so all, yes. but I appreciate you. You're uh, very generous. I, I think... Um, I mean, everything that's been said here, I, I, I'm just going to stick to the education question um, because I happen to be at a university. And I think the, the challenge for universities is... is, is um, we teach and we operate in the same way we've always taught and we've operated. And what you see is a generation of young people that want experience mixed with Should academics. still have the medieval capes on. Yeah, right, right exactly. <laughs> and what you see with this generation of young people is they're finding it in all of their extracurricular activities, they're finding experiential. Mm -hmm. They're going to intern places, they are going and working in other countries, they are, on, they are starting their own organizations. And we haven't figured out how to modernize that. We're just, we're like, let's teach. You should come to school for four years. You should do these things. Oh, by the way, go do your semester abroad in some country and have fun. But why not turn it into an experiential learning program where they're actually going to go solve a problem somewhere? If they're going to yeah. spend a semester, go spend a semester doing something. And let's make it interesting. And let's, rather than having them do it on their extracurricular time. So even within our own country, we need to rethink higher ed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And yes, in the science, and, and there's a lot happening in different universities on the science side, but all the other things that Phil talked about outside of the National Science Foundation and other places, we need to rethink this. And we need to offer different models and think about how are we going to learn. And frankly, some of the developing countries are going to do it faster. And China's going to probably get there before we will because they're thinking about it and we're not uh, because we're stuck with legacy systems. And, and if we just come back to what technology is, when you're stuck with a legacy system, doing new platforms is really hard. So we're going to have to either simultaneously figure out how to start a new platform while a legacy system operates, or we're going to have to figure out how to change this legacy system. Please join me in thanking the panel. This was yeah. great. Thank you.